Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a brand new series of 13 lessons on the three angels' messages. Now, I think every Seventh-day Adventist is supposed to be an expert on three angels' messages, aren't they? So this should be a very good series. This lesson number one for April 1 of 2023 is not an April Fool's joke. This one is entitled, Jesus Wins, Satan Loses. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, as we come to discuss this very important topic, help us to see how you are involved and especially how you want us to be involved in these final days of this earth's history is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 With this lesson, we begin a challenging study of Revelation 14, 6 through 12. I hope many of you have memorized those verses back when you were in school somewhere. They're called the three angels' messages. It is impossible to fully understand any part of the book of Revelation without first having a clear understanding of the whole book. So if it is possible, we would like to recommend to you one should read the book through from beginning to end in one sitting, if possible. It takes you an hour, an hour, an hour and a half, something like that. In at least two different versions, if that's possible, of the Bible in preparation for this study. So we're going to make a, give you some homework here. But this, there's, there's, you know, the book of Revelation is built like, we're going to talk about this a little bit, a chiasm, where it's focused on the middle, and the front, the first half matches with the second half. So we want you to be able to see the link back and forth between these two. So if it's possible for you to read uh, the thing all the way through and just have the, the pictures, the mental pictures in your mind as you study these lessons, it'll be very helpful. The entire New Testament is based on many details from the Old Testament. This is particularly true of the book of Revelation. It has been estimated there are between 600 and 1,000 references or inferences from the Old Testament found in the book of Revelation. How's that for a study? Of particular significance is one's understanding of the books of Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel in order to clearly understand the book of Revelation. In this particular lesson, we will be carefully studying Revelation 12. So if you have a Bible handy, open to Revelation 12 as an introduction to the core message of the book of Revelation is found in Revelation 12, 14. As I just suggested, uh, these three chapters spell out the great controversy from its beginning in the courts of heaven where Lucifer, standing next to the throne of God, rebelled and became Satan, the deceiver and opponent of God. Satan lost that first war against Michael, a code name for Jesus Christ himself, and was cast out of heaven. So Satan carried his rebellion to this earth, as we know, and convinced Adam and Eve to rebel, that is, to lose their trust in God and to sin. From that day until this, Satan has appeared to rule on this earth. But thank God we know that ultimately, in this great controversy, Jesus wins and Satan loses. Our task is just to remain firmly committed to Jesus' side in the great controversy. Look at Revelation tells us about the beginning of the great controversy. Let's start with the beginning. Jim? Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated, and he and his angels, excuse me, and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and all his angels with him, from the Good News Translation. Now it's essential, as you read through the book of Revelation, that you remember that dragon and devil and Satan and the deceiver, all of those things refer to what individual? Satan. 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 We're talking about the same one, no matter what language is used. So try to imagine how the number one angel, Lucifer, 
the light bearer. That, that's Latin for light bearer. One of the names of Christ could stand next to the throne of God and gradually develop a rebellious, selfish attitude. How is that possible? Because God is love. And you have to have freedom you can, to, to love. I mean, I can understand why God might allow it, but what, what was going on in the mind of Lucifer that he would dream up such a crazy notion? Self-centered. Yeah. Where did that come from? Without education, you, uh. finite beings don't conjure up truth. We know that God has foreknowledge. He knew what was coming. However, freedom, the power to choose, is absolutely essential in God's kingdom. Love is impossible without freedom. And love can never be forced. Desire of Ages 22 and 23. And those of you who want to study that detail a little bit more, you can look up at that website. It's our, at our website, www.theox.org. Go to general topics and look for the handout on love. And it will spell the details out for you why freedom is absolutely essential in order for love to exist. Um, and if, you, if, if you have the handout from us, you can just click on the handout there on the... If we consider timeline, if we say the world is about 6,000 years old, so this happened, uh, what we just read, it happened after creation and... No, before creation. Well, then what is the world? What? He was cast to the oh, he was, earth. He's cast down, cast down to this earth, not right. to this world. To the earth. Okay, There's that's fine. There, okay. The earth is the ball of, of water and mud and stone and so forth. The world is the beautiful creation that God originally placed on the surface of the earth. The world isn't the same as earth. Okay? So when was that created? We don't know. We don't know. Big, and, and you weren't there. I, if there's a there is a way to read uh, Genesis chapter one verses one and two. The gap but, theory. No, it's not oh. a gap. It's that big, uh, in beginning he created Elohim and the heavens and the earth, and the earth became a chaos. So now you have a place you can put this uh, Revelation uh, chapter what? twelve which is the war, what we call the war in heaven. And then you have, and, and let there be light, it could be enlightenment. It became a, a story of recreation, is what we have really in, in Genesis uh, chapter 1, verses 3 and following. Yeah. Well, what we know is this, that sometime before this, well, the Garden of Eden, let's say, was created, Satan was already here, and because he was given a place in the Garden of Eden. We know that. Those are the things we know for sure. However, this demonstrates to us that there is no middle ground in the great controversy. It is impossible to have your life governed by love and at the same time have it governed by selfishness. The choice is between love, God's way, versus selfishness, Satan's way. Unfortunately, in this world we are born selfish because of our, what our great parents did way back there in the Garden of Eden. Um, so we have, we have to intentionally choose, sorry, we have to intentionally choose love if we want to be on God's side. Carrie? Uh, from 2 Timothy 1.9, He saved us and called us to be His own people, not because of what we have done, but because of His own purpose and grace. He gave us this grace by means of Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. That's from the Good News Bible. And there's two or three passages in Scripture, we'll look at some of the other ones a little bit later, that tell us that God knew all this in advance and He still went ahead and did what He did. And this says before the beginning of time, that would mean before this world was created. God realized what the price was going to be when he created intelligent beings on this earth and allowed freedom. <clears throat> he could have made us robots, and then there wouldn't have been any risk. That's speculation. 
because if God is love, yeah. he's not doesn't just do it part time or does it no. because he had a yeah. burr under his saddle. Yeah, he no. just that's the way he is. Yeah, it's, no. it's like gravity. God is always yeah. but for freedom. God is love. Jesus realized what he was going to have to do when he came down to this world to combat sin and win against Satan. He knew that before he left heaven. That's hard to imagine. Let us again look at Revelation 12 and see if we can get a clear picture of what it means. Revelation chapter 12, verse 46. <coughs> With his tail, he dragged a third of the stars out of the sky and threw them down to the earth. He stood in front of the woman in order to eat her child as soon as it was born. Then she gave birth to a son who will rule over all the nations with an iron rod. But the child was snatched away and taken to God, his throne. The woman fled to the desert to a place God had prepared for her, where she will be taken care of for 1,260 days. Goodness Bible. Okay. Using biblical imagery, we've already now talked about what happened in heaven before sin came to this earth. Now we're talking about the great controversy that happened on this earth. Using biblical imagery, we are told that Satan managed to convince about one-third of the angels in heaven to follow him and rebel against God. That imagery is generally recognized, talks about the dragon dragged a third of the angels down with his tail. Many more had questions about God until the situation became clear to them at the cross, the men of the angels. Satan was cast to this earth before our world was created. This is shown by the fact that when the Garden of Eden was created, Satan was given a place in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I'm not going to, I don't have time to go through all the details, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil was intended to be a protection for Adam and Eve, not a test. So long as they did not go near that tree, which God told them not to do, they did not have anything to worry about. Satan couldn't chase them anywhere else in the garden, only at the one tree. It was only when they approached that tree that it became a test for them. Any questions about that? In Revelation 12, we notice several very important key figures. Dragon is the word used to describe Satan and his role. The picture of a woman is used to describe God's faithful church, both in times in the Old Testament and New Testament. The male child born to the one was Jesus Christ. The rod of iron is a code name for the rulership of this world, those who will be in control at whatever point. One important thing to understand in studying the book of Revelation is that it is organized as a chiasm. I tried to suggest that a little while ago. Chiasm is a English name for a Greek letter he is like a great big X, but we just think about the top half of it. What that means is that under God's guidance, John placed the most important portion of the book right in the middle, in Revelation 12 to 14. So that's what we're going to focus on this quarter. Revelation 1 through 11 talk about the history of things that sort of led up to where we are in this conflict. And Revelation 15 to 20 tell what will happen later in history. Revelation 12, 7 to 12 talk about the beginning of that war in heaven as we already noted. So, what things are very clear in this chapter? One, there was a war. Two, that war began in heaven, not on this earth. And that's something, believe it or not, very few people actually recognize. Even the people who, who talk about good versus evil and that kind of stuff. No, the war began in heaven. No human beings were there when the war began. None of us, not one. Correcto. Four, someone else started it. We've talked already about Lucifer, okay? We were not there when the, when the war started. Five, a non-human, therefore, will lose the war. A non-human will lose the war. Who could that be? The war will be won through bloodshed. 
that blood being the blood of the victor. That is the blood of the Lamb. We need to make it very clear that when Revelation says about the blood of the Lamb, is very different from what is usually stressed in traditional theology. And then number seven, the war is not fully over yet. Wow. How's that for a list of um, ideas that come out of that mm, passage? The war, as far as Jesus is concerned, the war ended at the cross when he says it is finished, it's over. But it's for you and me now, that's the story so far. Which means that the war is not really over. Some of us are still involved. Oh, absolutely. But the character was demonstrated ultimately. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. The, what's, the, what's really, truly really beautiful to me is here is the boss of the entire universe. He created the universe and someone taunting him and, uh, and then he never retaliates, he never, never even speaks, even going to the cross. Not like a boss. Hey, there, there he was. Not, he right does right not, right. God does not operate, right. the infinite one does not operate like a boss. Like a human boss. Right, right. He, he doesn't. He, he he's the well, ultimate boss. If, he, if if you remember, Ellen White says, if you can find an excuse for sin, yeah, it would cease to be sin, or it wouldn't be sin. It's just f love, yeah, freedom. <laughs> the natural result of an in, in, finite beings in time and space mm -hmm. functioning will have the opportunity. Well, even those not, uh, maybe yeah. uh, if angels are not in time and space, maybe, maybe, well, they are in time. He so. had no fear. The only fear he had, could this be eternal separation? That's the yes. only thing other than that, you know. Well, looking briefly at the entire chapter of Revelation 12, which is our focus for this week, we see a pattern. Just like the book of Revelation has that big B with Revelation 12 to 14 at the center point, Revelation 12 has a V with the center point, Revelation 12, 7 through 12, in the middle, and it's the center point. And what does it tell us? The war began in heaven. We know who the opponents are. It's the epicenter of the whole book of Revelation. In fact, if you start counting words, the center part of Revelation 12 is exactly in the middle of the book of Revelation. Which translation? They do. <laughs> well, I think that would, I suppose, some of the well, they paraphrase. Didn't separate, they didn't separate the Greek into words, yeah. did they? No, well, they did, yeah. But, well, they didn't always write it that way. Yeah, it's true. So, um, the story of the birth and life of Jesus on this earth is the decisive middle of this war. And that was the, is the beginning of Revelation verses 12, verses 1 to 5. The all-out assault on the rest of her children, the remnant, comprises the conclusion, Revelation 12, 13 to 17. So what do we have? We have the core thing right in the middle. Back at the beginning, we talk about Jesus and his birth and how he's involved. And then the last verses talk about how Satan is so angry, he's determined, since he couldn't do anything to Jesus, he's determined to conquer Jesus's, or God's favorite uh, 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 faithful people in Revelation 13, 12, 13 to 17. And then, of course, Revelation 13 to 20 give us much more detail about how ultimately the conflict is resolved, and that's what you're talking about, Charles. Um, it's not over until it's over. Think of this strange outcome. Jesus wins by dying. How is that possible? So the question we must ask is a question about human history on this earth. What has God done to destroy sin and all associated with it? Our sins are not to be covered over, they are to be removed. Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. And there beside Joshua stood Satan ready to bring an accusation against him. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Joshua was, Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes. The angel said to his heavenly angels, Take away the filthy clothes of this man is wearing. Okay, let me interrupt for a second. 
often in some Christian circles, the idea is that our sins aren't removed, they're sort of covered over by the blood of Christ. Now, what does this say? Take no. away the Take filthy. away the filthy car good clothes. Okay, go ahead. Then he said to Joshua, Take away your sin. I have I will I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. So again, not covering it up but giving new clothes. Right. He commanded his attendants to put on a clean t turban on Joshua's head, and they did so. And then they put uh, the new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there. Good news Bible. Okay, in <laughs> Philippians 3, 9, we're told that the righteousness that comes from God and is based on faith is what gives us the victory. How does that work? We can seek to follow Jesus and emulate his example, or we can reject him and practice the selfishness invented by Lucifer or Satan. Having faith means that we are daily studying the life of Christ and by beholding, we are being changed into his likeness, becoming partakers of the divine nature. Now, I wouldn't dare use those terms, but they're used by prophets. Romans 14, 23 tells us that, quote, anything that is not based on faith is sin. So what does that mean? It means as we, if we're drawing closer and closer to God, that's a process called faith. If we're running away from God and going closer and closer to Satan, that's called what? Sin. sin. One or the other. Faith, sin. Faith, sin. Okay. God's side, that is love, as we've already mentioned, is based on faith and our relationship with Him. Satan's side, selfishness, is based on sin and the world's relationship to Him. A brief survey of Scripture teaches us that in every battle between Christ and Satan, Christ wins. And it's interesting sometimes, see if you can think of all the times when there was a direct conflict between Christ and Satan. See if you can spell them out obvious ones are in heaven at the beginning uh, while Christ was here on this earth, but there are other ones. Think about the time when they fought over the body of Moses, for example. Mm -hmm. And Daniel. And Daniel. So, but should we consider Christ's death on the cross as a victory for Satan? Satan thought it was, at least as long as Jesus was still in the grave. And Ellen White tells us that he and his angels did everything they possibly could to keep him in the grave. As Christians who believe in Scripture, we can be confident that Satan has been defeated. Revelation 12, 11, Our brothers and sisters won the victory over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the truth which they proclaimed, and they were willing to give up their lives and die. Good news, would Bible. we, yeah, would we be willing to die for what we believe? I had a professor one time that was, we were talking about different Adventist ideas. He said, okay, I'm going to put it straight to you. Which Adventist teachings would you be willing to die for? That's a, that's a challenge. Yeah. Okay. In Revelation 2 through 4, we discover that among the seven churches are identified those who overcome. Revelation 12, 11 assumes, assures us, I'm sorry, that we can overcome through the blood of the Lamb. What does that mean? Well, Revelation 5, 6 says, Then I saw a Lamb standing in the center of the throne, surrounded by the four living creatures and the elders. The Lamb appeared to have been killed. So now, who sits on the throne in heaven? God. God. That's God's throne. So this lamb is standing in the center of the throne. So where would that be? That's right, in, it's right on the throne, isn't it? Uh, appeared to have been killed. It had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God that have been sent throughout the whole earth. The word slain in Revelation 5, 6 in the King James Version, or the word killed in the Good News Bible, means literally brutally slaughtered, not slain as in a sacrifice on the altar. It is often suggested by evangelical Christians that Christ was sacrificed as a sacrifice on an altar. 
This is not the correct picture. Exactly. Christ was brutally slaughtered in the battle between God and Satan in the great controversy. Ephesians 1 verse 7 and Colossians 1 verse 14 and Colossians 2 verse 14 tell us that God is willing to forgive our sins and set us free. He cancels the unfavorable record of our debts. Wow. Amen. But, as Charles already raised the question, the great controversy is not over. When Satan lost at the cross, he determined, he became even angrier to do anything he possibly could to defeat or even destroy God's faithful followers down to the following generations. Jim, can you tell us about that? Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. The woman fled to the desert to a place where God had prepared for her where she will be taken care of for 1260 days. Revelation chapter 12, 14 to 16. She was given the two wings of a large eagle in order to fly to her place of, in the desert where she will be taken care of for three and a half years, safe from the dragon's attack. And then from his mouth, the dragon poured out a flood of water after the woman so that it would carry her away. But the earth helped the woman. It opened its mouth and swallowed the water that had come from the dragon's mouth. From the Bible study guide, 1260 days in Revelation 12, 6. Just looked at. Are a parallel to the time, times and half the time in Revelation 12, 14. The same time prophecy describing the same time period is found in Daniel 7, 25. Revelation 11, verses 2 and 3, and Revelation 13, verse 5. Before these are, because. Me, because these are prophetic symbols, that is a literal woman with wings and do not have to go into the, did not, did not have to go into the wilderness, we apply prophetic time, that is the year, day principle, see for instance Numbers 14, 34, and Ezekiel 4, verses 4 to 6 in these prophecies. This means simply that one prophetic day equals one year. Commencing on this same prophetic period of time in Revelation 11:2, from the Andrews Study Bible states, historical inter interpreters therefore have generally understood the period of 1260 days to mean 1260 literal years running from AD 538 to 1798. Uh, okay. 13, 16, excuse me, page was a 1673 comments on Revelation 11, 2. A corrupt church together with a corrupt state oppressed, persecuted, and at times slaughtered God's faithful people from the Bible study guide for Wednesday, March 29. Okay. During this 1260 year period, the major event in that great controversy was the Protestant Reformation. Would people continue to be faithful and obey the priests and the Pope? Or would they ally themselves with God's word? Well, Protestants triumphed. Also during this time, while many Protestants were being captured and imprisoned or even killed, a new land was discovered across the ocean to which many persecuted Protestants fled. That was America. You can read about that in Revelation 12, verse 16. The Bible study guide, Carrie? The devil has been at war with Christ since his rebellion in heaven. From Revelation 12, 7. Satan's purpose then and his purpose now is to seize control of the universe. And in brackets it says, see Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. The focus of his attention in the last days of Earth's history is upon God's people. Revelation 12, 17 emphatically declares that the dragon, in brackets Satan, Satan, was wroth, in brackets again, angry with the woman, the church, and went to make war with the rest of her offspring. This expression, the rest of her offspring, also is translated the remnant in the King James Version. Uh, God's remnant remains loyal to Christ, obedient to, 
to his truth and faithful to his mission. That's from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Thursday, March 30. Okay, so the key verse, Revelation 12, 17, what does that say, Charles? The dragon was furious with the woman and went to off to fight against the rest of our descendants. All those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. Okay, so Revelation 12, 17 needs to be compared with Isaiah 14, 12 to 14 that we just referenced a little earlier. What can we learn about in Isaiah 14? Myra? King of Babylonia, bright morning star, you have fallen from heaven. In the past you conquered nations, but now you have been thrown to the ground. You were determined to climb up to, he to heaven and to place your crown above the highest stars. You thought you would sit like a king on that mountain in the north where the gods assemble. You said you would climb to the tops of the clouds and be like the Almighty. Okay, Good news, Bible. we don't have time to go into all the details here, but that mountain in the north, which talked about there, there, is spoken of in the book of Revelation as Armageddon, Armageddon when you translate, when you transliterate from Hebrew to, to Greek. It is clear from Revelation 12, 17, that God's faithful people in the final stages of the great controversy will be those who faithfully keep the commandments of God and teach the truth about God as revealed by Jesus. Satan is furious with these people. That's us. He knows that if they remain faithful, his time will be up. It is a life and death matter for him. That is Satan. So do you want to help being responsible for Satan's death? That's one murder I would be happy to be a part of. It wouldn't be murder. <laughs> well, sort of. It's a lawful ending of life. I see. It's one way of looking at it. Yeah. Murder is, in way English, we define it as an unlawful taking of a human life. Yeah. Those end time faithful people will be loyal to the truth as revealed by Jesus. What is that truth? It's the truth about God as opposed to the misinformation about God that is being spread by Satan and his followers. So the question there is, who are we going to believe? God or Satan? That's the question. Revelation 13 verses 3 through 8 suggests that almost, almost the entire world is going to worship Satan. To understand a little, better, a little bit about Satan's response to all we have studied so far, look at Revelation 13, 14 through 17. And it deceived all the people living on earth by means of the okay. miracles which okay. it was allowed to perform. Let me just interrupt for a second. It there is talking about one of these beasts, we're going to talk about them a little bit later, that are affiliated with Satan. Okay? Again, verse 14. And it deceived all the people living on earth by means of the miracles which it was allowed to perform in the presence of the first beast. The beast told them to build an image in honor of the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having this mark, that is, the beast's name, or the number that stands for that name. Good News Bible. So is the beast and the dragon, the both beasts and the dragon, are they serious about this? Very. First of all, a death decree, and then if we can't get your death decree, we'll make it impossible for you to buy and sell. They want to get rid of all of God's faithful people. The, there's two beasts in here though, right? Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, this one, uh, no one could buy or sell, it's imposed or it's started by the first beast. And well, it's yeah, imposed in cooperation by between this. first and second beast. Right, and, uh, and the reformers, John Newton, in fact, he believed that the second beast, this was in the early 1700s, 
he believed that the second beast was not too far in those days. Not too far away? Not too far away, right. Mm -hmm. Because they studied their scriptures. Yeah. They studied their scriptures. Okay, do we have any idea about how this final battle might actually play out? Ellen White says, the, quote, image to the beast, end quote, represents that form of apostate Protestantism, which will be, in other words, it's not true Protestantism, it's apostate Protestantism, which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. The mark of the beast still remains to be defined. Okay, let's think about that for a moment. The, in order for it to be a beast, what combination do we have to have? Religious and political. Religious and political. And well, along with the political, it probably is, is military or um, you know, be able force. To impose, right. Yeah, yeah, okay. And you also have commercial now. I mean, yeah. we, we've been experiencing right. that. It's right. e economic uh, right. yep. uh, for, for force. What do they call that? The uh, misinformation board or whatever they do yeah. with Twitter and what have you. After the warning against the worship of the beast and his image, the prophecy declares, quote, Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Since those who keep God's commandments are thus placed in contrast with those that worship the beast in his image and receive his mark, it follows that the keeping of God's law on the one hand and its violation on the other will make the distinction between the worshipers of God and the worshipers of the beast. Great Controversy 445-446. When God's presence was, presence was finally withdrawn from the Jewish nation, priests and people knew it not. Though under the control of Satan and swayed by the most horrific, horrible and malignant passions, they still regarded themselves as the chosen of God. The ministration in the temple continued. Sacrifices were offered upon its polluted altars, and daily the divine blessing was invoked upon a people guilty of the blood of God's dear Son and seeking to slay his ministers and apostles. So when the irrevocable decision of the sanctuary has been provoked, been pronounced, I'm sorry, and the destiny of the world has been forever fixed, the inhabitants of the earth will know it not. So at the actual point of the closing probation, who knows, who on this earth knows it? Nobody. The forms of religion will be continued by a people from whom the Spirit of God has been finally withdrawn and the satanic zeal with which the Prince of Evil will inspire them for the accomplishment of his malignant designs will bear the semblance of zeal for God. As the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom, and religious and secular authorities have combined to enforce the observance of the Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them object of universal execration. Now these, this is still, we're reading from Ellen White. It will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and the law of the state ought not to be tolerated. That is, better for them to suffer than for whole nations to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. The same argument many centuries ago was brought against Christ by the rulers of the people. Quote, it is expedient for us, said the wily Caiaphas, that one man should die for the people then, and that the whole nation perish not, John 11:50. This argument will appear conclusive and a decree will finally be issued against those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, denouncing them as deserving of the severest punishment and giving the people liberty after a certain time to put them to death. Romanism in the old world and apostate Protestantism in the new will pursue a similar course toward those who honor all the divine precepts. I'm sorry, that's a fairly lengthy passage from Great Conference page 16 to 6, 615 to 616, but it's very, very important piece of this whole puzzle. So, what does our Bible study guide say, Jim? In a sense, we could argue that God has no choice. If he wanted things, he could have wanted beings 
who could love him and love others, he had to create them free. If they were not free, they could not love, and that would, excuse me, and what would our universe be like without love? It would be become this, be, it, it would, would be, be what, what some people claim, claimed nothing but a mindless machine that works according to strict laws of cause and effect and in which we have no free will, no free choice, and nothing, excuse me, and are nothing but flesh and blood packets of subatomic particles that follow only the laws of physics. Not exactly a pretty picture, nor does it represent what we know in, the, in and out of ourselves to be true. Who among us thinks, for instance, that our love for our parents, our children, our spouses is nothing but an arrangement of atoms? This is from the Bible Study Guide for March 31st. Would you want to live forever in a universe without love? God wouldn't either. <laughs> it would be a hell for him too, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. And yet, all the Protestants today believe that there's going to be lawless hell all well, throughout they, eternity. They got a movie out, a replay or whatever is a left behind thing. I, I don't watch, yeah. watch that. No. Never did. Filth, but anyway. Okay, Carrie, look what Ellen White says about this. The law of love being the foundation of the government of God, the happiness of all intelligent beings depends upon their perfect accord with its great principles of righteousness. God desires from all his creatures the service of love, service that springs from an appreciation of his character. He takes no pleasure in a forced obedience, and to all he grants freedom of will, that they may render him voluntary service. Yeah, let me interrupt for a moment. <clears throat> Why do you suppose God wants love from all of his creatures? That's what his government is based on. Yeah. I mean, he, he refuses to operate a universe on any other principle. We wouldn't want him to operate a universe on any other principle. Okay? Well, he probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't continue to function. It would just collapse. Yeah. It, 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 it would, they would, people would destroy each other. Yeah. So long as all created beings acknowledge the allegiance of love, there was perfect harmony throughout the universe of God. It was the joy of the heavenly hosts to fulfill the purpose of their creator. They delighted in reflecting his glory and showing forth his praise. And while love to God was supreme, love for one another was confiding and unselfish. There was no note of discord to mar the celestial harmonies. And that's from Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets 34, 3 through 35. We have suggested that Satan's attack on Jesus was not only during his infancy, but rather was during his entire life. I mean, think about Satan. We know that ultimately, when it's all done and said, but when Christ died on the cross, and maybe I should add, when he rose on Sunday morning, Satan's kingdom was doomed. Okay, we know that's a fact. So what do, you, what, what do you suppose Satan and his angels would be doing while Jesus is alive here on this earth? They're going to do everything they possibly can to destroy him, to destroy his influence, to destroy the people that are his followers. I mean... It is a life and death matter for them. To impugn his character, to yeah. destroy his character is yeah. what, what the whole goal has been. Yeah. So Satan did everything he could think of to destroy the life and influence of Jesus. For three days and th three nights, that's the expression in Scripture, from Friday afternoon to early Sunday morning, Satan celebrated the death of Jesus. But then came the resurrection of Satan, and Satan's doom was sealed. And I like to talk about that a little bit. Jesus said, what's going to happen when he's dead in the tomb? I can lay down my life and I can take it up again. And Satan has tried to claim that he is equal with Christ. So when Christ rose out of that tomb, he could have stopped for a second and turned to the devil and said, okay, let's see you do that. Yeah. That's the proof. 
we know that he was divine because he could, ri he could rise from the grave in his own power. Are you certain that God will win in the end? Are you convinced of that? Could Satan actually be defeated? Look at what is happening in our world today. Does it look like Satan's being defeated? No. Not at the time. Huh? The book of Revelation begins with Revelation 1 and the glorious picture of Christ in heaven. It ends with the glorious picture of the new earth, Christ with his redeemed people living on in a perfect world. In between, we have Revelation 12, the epicenter of the book, spelling out the crisis that developed and its resolution. Looking down through history, we realize that Satan has destroyed so many of God's people. At times when Satan cannot actually kill or destroy God's people, he does his best to weaken their influence. But he has never been able to fully wipe out God's influence. Charles? The candle of truth may have flickered, but it has been never been snuffed out. There has always been a light in the darkness. Eventually, the entire earth will be lighted with the glory of God. The American writer James Russell Lowell states well in a poem, The Present Crisis, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet the scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. It's a famous, that's made into a song that we sing, isn't it? Yeah, from the Bible Study Guide, page 14. So how did God win the great controversy? The death of Jesus on the cross answered once and for all the major questions in the great controversy and how many people in our world have any idea that that's how he won how many have any idea about the great controversy most religions have not the slightest they don't even know what your what that phrase means some have the concept of a battle between good and evil but yeah. it's just good and evil it's yeah. not over the character, the character. of god and, and how he not, runs his government. They, want, they operate on their level of force. Like, may the force be with you, which is the antithesis of the way the Creator mm -hmm. operates. Okay, question. Would we be better off with God's plan for the universe? Absolutely. Beings are ruled by love for God and for all other creatures? Or God's would we... Ruling. God, God doesn't rule. Yeah. They have, no. they have freedom. It's his, it's, it's his rules that, it's his law that rules. That well, it's, it's the law of how things work. It's the yeah. physics. God explains the physics. Why did he say uh, the, the most important law, uh, or the foremost law, or the foremost commandment? But it's really not a command. It's a prescription. It's a precept. And that is, listen up. Yeah. Okay, or would we be better off with Satan's plan for the universe? That is selfishness, putting self first in every situation. If the universe deteriorated to that, it would self-destruct. Mm. God had said that sin leads to death. Satan claimed that was a lie. Remember Genesis 2.17 and Genesis 3.1-4. The truth, maybe we should look at those in case somebody is, hasn't looked at them recently. Genesis 2.17, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad, you must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you, do, you will die the same day. Or that could be, interpret, you could be, and translated, you will certainly die. And then chapter 3, 1 to 4, and now the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord had made. The snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat the fruit from any tree in the garden? And he, he literally, in the way it's worded in Hebrew, did God tell you not to eat the fruit from any tree in the garden? In other words, you can't eat the fruit from any tree. We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. She had a predisposition. She wanted, she wanted to know what, what that thing was like. It, it, yeah. Satan didn't have to do anything. He just... <laughs> he didn't even have to tell a lie mm -hmm. 
to, to, get, to, 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 to get the results that, that we all live with. Well, he may have told a lie that we don't have recorded. Well, okay, we're arguing from silence, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, he said God no. lied. Yeah. Right. That was right. a lie. Mm. He got, yeah, okay. God didn't. That, you're, that, that, if he, if yeah. that's what I, I, my memory is yeah. fading then, because that, that would be, you're, you're absolutely yeah. true if that be so the case. It's just coming up. Yeah, it's coming up. The, say, say, that the snake replied, that's not true. You will not die. So that's that, a direct. In other words, God con- was wrong. God lied to you is what yeah. the snake was saying. And yeah. yet today the entire Christendom. Why is that lie? And the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole theology of Christendom and well, most religions is based upon that lie. That's why they have hell. Yeah. Because you're not going to give blessings I mean, and goodies to, to the good, you would, to the bad dudes. So you got to have a hell because you don't die. You would, you, you wouldn't be good unless there's someone there to force you, would you? That's a big argument most most yeah. religions have. If, if you wouldn't do it if if there wasn't a club someplace out there to hanging over your head. Well, Satan goes on to say. Because he knows, that is God, knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. Hmm. Wow. What a sad story. The truth was spelled out on the cross when God separated his life-giving forces from Jesus, the human Jesus, and the results of unrivaled sin were seen. Sin pays his wage. What's the wage? Death. Death. On the cross, Jesus asked, why have you forsaken me, not why are you killing me? We cannot become overcomers and join God's side by our own inherent willpower. Ellen G. White says, all who will can become overcomers. Let us strive earnestly to reach the standard set before us. Christ knows our weaknesses, weakness, and to him we can go daily for help. It is not necessary for us to gain strength a month ahead. We are to conquer from day to day. Mm. Okay, going on. um, We become overcomers by helping others to overcome, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The keeping of the commandments of God will yield in us an obedient spirit and the service that is the offspring of such a spirit. God can accept. That's from a letter. Uh, 1908. Yeah, 1908. 1908. It's included in the Bible commentary. Can I, can I say something about that? What you that uh, uh, Genesis three? Uh-huh. That is an interpretation based upon the Good News translation that you God lied to you. That is apparent. I don't believe is in the in the Greek or in the Hebrew. Hebrew. It's well, a, it basically he says God's not telling you the truth. He well, does but say you're that. that's an interpretation. The text basically says um, you will not die, or you yeah. Yeah, you you will not die. So God said you will die. He said you will not die. That's, that's true. However, based upon, the, based upon the lifetime experience of, of Satan and all the intelligent creatures, yeah. those that have the thought capacity, never seen death. Yeah. Now, you remember the, the commercial that says uh, past performance is no indicator of future, future results? Yes. But the serpent and Satan did not understand God's foreknowledge. Yeah. Well, right. And, Does that make and, sense? Yeah, I understand that, but I do not believe that God would say to Adam and Eve, if you eat this fruit, you will die without giving any explanation. And Satan should have heard that explanation. That, that, that could very well be, but yeah. the, we don't have a text to support that position yeah. is what I'm trying okay. to say. That's, you know, we're, we're reading into something based upon yeah. our point of view. Yeah. Unfortunately, both Satan and Jesus know our weak points. <clears throat> Satan is doing everything he can to exploit those weak points to lead to our defeat. Jesus promises to deliver, to deliver us from guilt and the grip of sin if we stay close to him. While Revelation 12:11 makes it clear that those who remain faithful to God will win the victory over Satan, 
Revelation 12, 17 tells us that the, that battle will not be an easy one. Victory will come only for those who are keeping God's commandments and are committed to telling the truth as revealed by Jesus. Satan always loves help. He calls on two human agencies to assist him. Revelation 13, 1 through 18, and I, we don't have time to read that whole thing, but we've already spoken about the two beasts, the beast that comes up out of the sea, and later the beast that comes up out of the earth. And these two beasts, are, what are they going to do? They are going to ultimately declare the death decree on anyone who doesn't join Satan's side. That's the message of Revelation 13. Is when no man can buy or sell, is that going to come before or after? Well, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, if you've already declared that they're all going to die, does it matter whether... It's not, <laughs> right. But this this yeah. is what we have now with the ESG, the, uh, with the environmental, social, just, uh, governmental, the mm -hmm. ESG, they're all coming in. That's, that, that's... Other parts of the world apparently have. Uh, China, they claim, some, uh, some, uh, and it's... <laughs> It's just probably sitting there ready to pounce on the rest of us. It's coming. Well, hey, pay, PayPal did that. Yeah. Okay. If you if you say something that they don't like, that you know, they'll, they'll they'll take money out of your account. Wow. And that's pretty severe. So, Revelation 13 ends up saying this calls for wisdom. Whoever is intelligent can work out the meaning of the number of the beast because that the number stands for a human name. Its number is 666. Yeah. And there's very interesting background to that, but we won't have time to talk about that right now. However, we know exactly what will be the final end of all three of them, and we don't have time to read the text, but we know that the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are going to be thrown where? Into the lake of fire. Lake of fire. Seventh-day Adventists understand that these two beasts represent the papacy, that is the Roman Catholic Church, or church state power and the United States respectively. Furthermore, so close to line to spiritualism with Satan that the dragon is a symbol for both. Under the auspices of the threefold union, the dragon, spiritualism, the beast from the sea, the papacy, and the beast from the land, also known as the false prophet, apostate Protestantism, um, uh, under the auspices of the United States, Satan will make war on the remnant of God's people. And we're running out of time. So what is a remnant? And we know that the remnant in this particular situation are those people who remain faithful to their God up to the very end. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this clear spelling out of the issues in the great controversy and the two sides help us to not make a bad choice as to which side we want to be on. We know it's natural for human beings to be selfish, but God has another plan for us, a plan of love which is so far superior that there's no comparison. Help us to follow that plan is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.